This surely is one of my favorite chapters of the Bible. So you ask why? Because maybe you don't even know it. It so clearly assures us of the triumph of the gospel of Jesus Christ. When in the early 1970s, when I was at seminary, when I was looking forward to my life's work as a preacher, I often preached on this chapter because of the encouragement it gives to preachers and to the church of Jesus Christ to be absolutely sure of our ultimate success. There is no chapter of the Bible quite like it. And that's why I encourage you at the beginning, please go home and read it. May I say, enjoy it. Uh, revel in it at the arguments and the statements that are made. In the first six verses of the chapter, we have the second servant song, as we call it. Just accept that that's a description. There are four of them, the first is in chapter 42, and now there's a second one, and that is Isaiah 49. What we notice here is that the speaker is the servant himself. It's rather a unique passage. Listen to me. It's not Isaiah who is asking people to listen to him. Who is he telling you Isaiah? This one is far greater than any human prophet. So throughout the first six verses, it's the servant speaking or reporting what the Lord has said to him and about him. So it's very much autobiographical. You can see that there's a twofold pattern here. First of all, the servant speaks and then he reports what the Lord said by way of response. Do you see that? Verse 1, listen to me, O coastlands. Then verse 3, and he said to me. Then verse 4, but I said, so again it comes back to what the servant himself says. And in verse 5, and now the Lord says, and he repeats what the Lord has said to him. if you're with me. But where else in the Bible are you made privy to the communication between the servant, the Lord Jesus Christ, and God? Where you are, John 17, the high priestly prayer, by this, it's a rare occurrence in the Bible, isn't it? Where we, as it were, listen in to the divine communication. So I say to you, this is a very great scripture. And it's all about the greatness of the task that the servant will accomplish. How God has prepared him for it, but he seems to have failed before. And so there comes the Lord's assurance that the success will be nothing less than worldwide. And after the psalm, the first six verses, then if you read the rest of the chapter, there is encouragement upon it, encouragement to, to have assurance that this will come to pass. For example, verse 7. The Lord is speaking to one who is deeply despised. That surely is the servant. It's what he's saying by way of encouragement. Kings shall see and arise. Princes, and they shall prostrate themselves. It's going to happen. The, the rulers of the nations are going to come 
and acknowledge the Lord. And there are many, many other statements here. For example, verse 22. Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I will lift up my hand to the nations and raise my signal to the peoples, and they shall bring your sons in their bosom, and your daughters shall be carried on their shoulders. Kings shall be your foster fathers, and their queens your nursing mothers. This is the picture that you have throughout this wonderful chapter. Three things that I want to bring to you. They're all about the servant. First of all, this servant is prepared. In verses 1 to 3, in verse 1, he calls to the peoples, the coastlands, those are the farthest extents of the globe. They'll go to the most remote parts, the furthest in distance. He calls upon them to listen to him. Therefore, he's got something relevant to say to them. Will you notice again that the whole work that the servants got to do has to do with speaking. Listen to me. I'm going to speak to you. Now this universal ministry was already declared in the first song. I hope you remember where he's going to bring forth justice to the nations. Even the coastlands wait for his law. We read. Now how is the servant going to accomplish that? Well, like any servant of God, there are two things which are necessary. First of all, he's got to be called of God. Nobody can do a work for God unless God calls them to that work. So verse 1 says, The Lord called me from the womb, from the body of my mother. He named my name. Can you think of others who were called from the womb? This servant's not the only one. Jeremiah. Jeremiah chapter 1 verse 5. Even Paul. You read what he says. In Galatians 1 and verse 15, God so often designates the work of a person and calls them from even before they are born. And he says, He named my name when I was still in the womb. And you know that the name is not simply well, you know, I like the name Paul, so I'll give my son the name Paul. It's not that. The name describes the person, his character, even his work. So when it says he named my name, it's not that some name is given on the birth certificate. It's that he had already marked me out for a particular work. What was the name of the son to be born? Mary? You should call his name? Jesus. Was that because it's just a nice name? J-E-S-U-S? No. For he shall save, what the name Jesus means. He shall save his people from their sin. So the name describes the work that he's going to do. In fact, here, it seems that the name is Israel. Verse 3. You are my servant, Israel, in whom I will be glorified. And this is where people start getting confused. If you look at the passage, you no need to be confused. This can't be the nation of Israel. Because this one is going to gather Israel back to God, verse 5. So he can't be Israel, but can he? The nation. Nor can it be the remnant, because he's also going to bring back 
the preserved of the remnant of Israel, verse 6. He is, of course, the individual servant. And he's called Israel because he's the true, faithful, real Israel of God. He will do the work that Israel as a nation was given to do, but that they failed to do. They were to be faithful witnesses unto the Lord. You know chapter 43 and verse 10, God says, You are my witnesses. Sadly, that's where Jehovah's Witnesses get their name from. You are my witnesses, declares the Lord, and my servant to my children. But Israel, by their idolatry, by their refusal to walk in the way of the Lord, they were unfaithful witnesses. So the work that he's come to do has been given to him by God. And so this work is the divine plan for the world, even extending to the coastlands and the peoples from afar. What is the work? You have it in verse 5. It was to bring Jacob back to, you know, Jacob, just another name for Israel. So you have the parallel statement, and that Israel might be gathered to him. That was his particular work to which he was called. But you not only need to be called, you need to be equipped. So, verse 2 tells us about his equipment. Once again, it has to do with speaking. He has to be equipped in terms of his ability to bring the message that he's been given for the nations. And so, primarily, the servant of the Lord, Jesus Christ, he is the great prophet. And by using the figures of the weapons of sharp sword and polished arrow, you know that the work of bringing the message is going to be a struggle. There will be enemies. There will be warfare. But he is prepared with weapons which will accomplish the task. You don't do much with a blunt sword, do you? But his short sword is sharp. You don't do much with a polished arrow, you need an arrow which will speed through the air like the lightning and get to its mark. The words of the servant will be like that. They are powerful and penetrating. If there's a distinction here, the sword is for enemies that are near you. You use a sword in hand-to-hand -hand combat. The arrows are for enemies afar as you aim your arrow to fly through the air. Interestingly, both of them are to be concealed, aren't they? In the shadow of his hand, he hid me. In his quiver, he hid me away. Don't miss details like that. That means they are there ready for use at the time appointed. Right now, they're in the quiver, they're in the sheep. The time will come, God's time, when they will be unsheathed and the arrow will be put to the bow and they will be used with devastating effect. So if this is about Jesus Christ, isn't that Great work of Christ. Was he not a prophet? Did he not come to proclaim the gospel of the kingdom? Let's not minimize his teaching ministry. It's absolutely fundamental to his work. Look, for example, in Luke's gospel in chapter 4. Luke's gospel.
Gospel chapter 4, verse 15 says, And he taught in their synagogues, being glorified by all. Then from verse 16, there's the particular time in Nazareth. It says he came to Nazareth, where he'd been brought up. That was his custom. He went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day. He stood up to read. And the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written. And look at these words from Isaiah 61. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favour. That's the great work. Am I saying he didn't come to die? Of course I'm not saying that. But unless his death and the fruits of his death is proclaimed, will accomplish nothing. So the proclamation is absolutely fundamental. Then if you go to the end of the chapter, when he had gone to a desolate place, verse 42, people sought him. They wanted to keep him. He said in verse 43 of Luke 4, I must preach the good news of the kingdom of God to the other towns as well, for I was sent for this purpose. And he was preaching in the synagogues of Judea. He's called and he's equipped. So back in Isaiah 49 then, we find the servant tempted. Verse 4. But I said, I have laboured in vain. I have spent my strength for nothing and vanity. You know, here's one of these prophetic <coughs> insights into the mind of our Lord. This is why this is so amazing. Here is Christ revealing to the prophet Isaiah the spirit of Christ as Peter writes in 1 Peter 1. Telling Isaiah what his inner thinkings and temptations are. Remember, Christ has been tempted in every point as we are. Despite three years of constant faithful ministry, weary ministry, speaking the word, backed up by the miracles which were signs conveying the truth of his message, it all seemed in vain. The very beginning of his ministry, we read in Luke 4, what was their response? When he said, this has been fulfilled in your hearing. When he said, pointing back to the Old Testament, that there were times when God went to the Gentiles and called Gentiles because the Jews were unfaithful. Oh, they hated this message. And they would have taken him up to the brow of the hill and cast him down the hill to his death. That's how it started. Not very easy, is it, to go home and find that you're rejected. And as you read about his three years of ministry, you know there was increasing hatred and opposition to silence him, to trip him up, and finally to put him to death especially by the Jewish leaders. In the beginning of his ministry he had many followers, but when he said, I am the bread that's come down from heaven, they looked at him and said, how can you say that? We know you know you're in your father, as they thought. Who are you to say you 
come from heaven. And so many in John 6 we read turned their backs upon him. So he came to near the end of the ministry. Yes, they crowded the, the streets of Jerusalem, putting palm leaves uh, on the streets, crying, Hosanna! They didn't know what they were saying, did they? They didn't understand who he was. They thought he was coming to release them from the bondage of the Romans, but he wasn't coming for that at all. So when the chief priest stirred up the crowd, it was only a matter of days when Hosannas turned into crucify him. So Jesus there, before his death, he stood on the hill, he looked over Jerusalem, and he wept. Didn't he? Jerusalem, Jerusalem. How often I would gather, gather you to me, as a hen gathers a chick, but you would not. Temptation to think that you've laboured in vain. In the end, all his disciples were sick. Especially the one who made the most noise, that he would never forsake them. And only some women. But even they, we are told, they stood at a distance, watching. There, he died. There were about 120 who gathered the courage before the day of Pentecost to meet in the upper room. Considering he had been given such a great task, considering he's the Son sent from heaven, can you understand now why he could be tempted? I have laboured in vain. I have spent my strength for nothing and vanity. What's the hundred percent? Under, uh, in, in relationship to the, the millions in Israel. And especially because he was called and equipped by the Lord. You would think, here it is, there must now be great success. Because God's hand is upon him. So how does the servant deal with this temptation? Look at verse 4. It's how he replies. Yet, surely my right is with the Lord, and my recompense with my God. Very basically, instead of looking to himself, or to the uh, situation, the lack of results, he looks to God because it's God who's chosen him. And he says, my right, and there's the parallel phrase below, my recompense, my reward, is with God. God will bring it, and he'll bring it as and how he chooses. It's rather like what Peter writes in 1 Peter 2, when Jesus is suffering unjustly. It says, he entrusted himself to God who judges justice. That's the way to deal with such a temptation. We commit ourselves to God, knowing that he's called us, he's equipped us, that we have been faithful, and that God will bring the fruit that he desires. Then thirdly, climax now. The servant is assured in verses 5 and 6. He reports what the Lord has said to him. He proclaims that he is honoured, the end of verse 5, he's honoured in the sight of the Lord. That is, the Lord holds the servant in such esteem that it's the Lord's delight, it's his pleasure to honour his servant. After all, the Lord has called him and he's equipped him. He's very special to him. Remember chapter 42? Behold my servant, whom I uphold, my child, 
chosen in whom my soul delights. And he's sure that God is so present with him that he's got all the strength of God. He says at the end of verse 5, and my God has become my strength. So now he makes known the great pronouncement from the Lord that he has such a great task to perform. Yes, part of this task is to restore the Old Testament people of God, Jacob and Israel, beginning in verse 5. But verse 6, the Lord says, that is too small a task. You are such a great person, my beloved servant. I've got to give you a correspondingly great task to perform. So you see the language? It's too light or too small a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to bring back the preserved of Israel. I'll make you as a light for the nations that my salvation may reach to the end of the earth. He's going to be a light. I told you before, look at the parallel lines. Light and salvation are parallel, aren't they? I'll make you as a light for the nations is parallel to my salvation to the ends of the earth. So to be a light is to bring salvation because to be in darkness is to be in sin. And darkness is quite a common theme in Isaiah. Some of us read in the, in the prayer meeting, Isaiah 9 and verse 2, the people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in a land of deep darkness, on them the light has shined. And then it says, to us, a child is born. It's the servant again, in the context of light in darkness. Or in this very chapter, chapter 49, verse 9. The Lord, in speaking to his servant, says, You will say to the prisoners, Come out, and to those who are in darkness, appear. It's the darkness of sin. But it's with the emphasis upon ignorance and error. Remember, the whole work of the servant is to proclaim a message, is to proclaim the truth, to inform the ignorant, to proclaim the truth as against the false teaching of idolatry. And the fact that he's going to be the light shows that salvation comes by the knowledge of the truth. Is that not so? God desires that all men be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. That's what salvation is all about. You can't be saved without hearing the truth, can you? And then believe in it with all your heart. That message. Now Jesus surely built upon this passage, didn't he? Have you not heard now in your ears what the Lord Jesus said in John 8, 12? You don't hear it. I am the light of the world. One of those great I am sayings. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. But amazingly, even Paul quoted this to refer to himself. <coughs> Excuse me. And his 
fellow preachers. Look at Acts chapter 13. In other words, this is not to be simply spoken of as Christ, but as of Christ and his people. He is born in Acts 13 in Antioch. There's been a great crowd of people for the preaching, but the Jews are jealous because so many Gentiles have come, and they oppose Paul. And Paul says, if that's your attitude, we shall cease preaching to you. We're going to turn to the Gentiles. Verse 46. Now look at what he says in verse 47. For so the Lord has commanded us, saying, now he quotes Isaiah 49. And verse 6, I have made you a light for the Gentiles, that you may bring salvation to the ends of the earth. So this servant song, yes, it's primarily about Christ, but we who follow Christ, who walk in his footsteps, who continue with his ministry of proclamation, it's us also. Shows that Jesus' ministry <coughs> is a pattern for ours. In the Old Testament times, it was God's plan that the light be kept in Israel. Almost no attempt was made to take the light and carry it outside the confines of the boundaries of Israel. You can think of an occasion? Jonah. And when you said Jonah, that might be a moment. Otherwise, it was there in the land of Canaan. That was God's plan. To keep the light burning. It was hard enough to keep the light burning amongst the Israelites. But it was God's plan that with the coming of the servant, the light was to shine worldwide. It was to be taken, like the Olympic torch, to be taken throughout the nations. You remember, having been raised from the dead, what did Jesus command his disciples now? Something he didn't command before. In fact, before he said, just go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. So he told them. Go elsewhere. Go to Israel. Now, on the basis of his resurrection and impending exaltation and the pouring out of the Spirit, what does he say? Mark says, Go into all the world. That's what you have here in Isaiah chapter 49. And the rest of Isaiah 49 gives confidence in the success of that mission and especially in answer to two objections. If you look at Isaiah 49 and verse 14. But Zion says, The Lord has forsaken me. My Lord has forgotten me. You know, we're under judgment. And it's true. We're in exile. How can we possibly think of the worldwide uh, progress of the kingdom of God when we're under the judgment of God? Look at the beautiful response of the Lord, verse 15. Can a woman forget her nursing child that she should have no compassion on the son of her womb? Even these may forget, yet I will not forget. Behold, I have engraved you on the palms of my hand. Now you know where Mr. Top Lady got his words from in his head, don't you? Your walls are continually before me. Yes, a nursing woman could forget a child. I can't forget you. Just not possible, God says. Yes, I'm disciplining you. What an encouragement that is. Then there's another objection in verse 24 of Isaiah 49. 
Can the prey be taken from the mighty, or the captives of the tyrant be rescued? You're telling us to go to the nations, but don't you know that those nations are in the grip of tyrants? How can we go there? We'll be killed. We won't be listened to. They're too powerful. Look at the response. But that says the Lord, verse 25, even the captives of the mighty shall be taken, and the prey of the tyrant be rescued, for I will contend with those who contend with you. I will save your children. <coughs> what Jesus said. He talked about people who are bound by a strong man. He says, what's needed is the stronger man come. He binds a strong man, then he releases his goods. Do you remember Jesus saying that? That's what you have here. Jesus picking up that picture is in Isaiah chapter 49. And God keeps on repeating in this chapter that the salvation that the servant comes to bring, it will reach the ends of the earth. Well, what does this say to us? And I've got two things to bring to you. First of all, how should we deal with the temptations to discouragement because of the lack of success? There are many temptations, haven't there? Come on, you have them. I have them. They could be on a very big scale. You read the newspaper. You may fear that Islam <coughs> is poised to take over the world. That is its agenda. And they'll do it by fair means and foul. And you read what's going on. You may very well fear for the next generation. Or you fear that secularism will triumph. The power of evolution, of humanism, of atheism is growing stronger by the day. It appears, doesn't it? You wonder, what's going to happen? Our children go to school, they're just subjected to all this false teaching. Is there any hope? Apparently, a great percentage of children who grew up in Christian families by the time they leave college have left the church. There's increasing persecution, isn't it? They say more Christians have been martyred in the last hundred years than in the previous 1900 put together. There's every reason to be tempted, isn't there? Then of course you can look to yourself and you say, I've made such little progress. I've tried to be a witness to my family, my husband, my wife, my children, my friends. They never listen. It's gone nowhere. They're still as worldly, as opposed, as they were last year. Or we could look at our church. Yeah, we've got some encouragements here, but why are you going to these agencies? Some of you could be discouraged. Why aren't we growing? Churches are going to their land. Why? When you look around and you see the popularity of false teaching, it's very easy to hold your hands up, isn't it? And wonder, can we actually continue? Is it worth it? Now, in this passage, Christ faced the reality. There was a time when Paul was about to give up. Do you believe it? Even the great Paul, who could pick himself up after being stoned in Lystra, and then he's found in Iconium, preaching. Yes, even Paul and Corinth, he needed the Lord to come and encourage him. And he said to Paul, Acts 18 verse 9, Paul, don't be afraid. Keep preaching, Paul. I've got many people in this. Nobody's going to attack you to harm you, Paul. Clearly, Paul was about to give up. Corinth was an intellectual city. 
and that worldly wisdom. Corinth was a poor city like Mombasa, and so the immorality would, was at its height in such a place. How do you bring the gospel that tells people that they're sinners to such a place? So, if you're being tempted, my brother and my sister, not the first one, I mean, your Lord has been tempted at all points that we are. How do you answer it? Look at the passage. God has called you to be a Christian. Hasn't he? Well, if God has called you, he must have a purpose for you, mustn't he? And if God's got a purpose, can that purpose really fail? Then he's equipped you for the task he has for you. Now the results are his. In farming terms, he's given you the land to cultivate, and he's given you the seed to plant. But the harvest depends upon him. You be faithful. There will be a harvest. Sometimes we look at the negative three soils in the parable of the soil. But why don't we focus on the fourth? Because there is a fourth, isn't there? There may be seed which plucked up immediately. There may be seed which grows a bit and withers because the soil is shallow. There may be seed which is choked by thorns. But there is seed that falls on good ground because God is prepared. It. And it will bring forth fruit, some thirtyfold, some sixtyfold, some a hundredfold. It will be accomplished in God's own time. And that's the difficulty we have, isn't it? We're not very patient. Maybe we need some farming lessons from, from farmers who will tell you that I'm going to plant, but the sky looks absolutely blue. I can't see a cloud in the sky. But I'm going to plant anyway. They have no assurance of a harvest. We have it. Because it's God's word. Actually, Isaiah gives it to us in chapter 55. You know the verse very well. Verse 10. For as the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return there, but water the earth, making it bring forth and sprout, giving seed to the sower and bread to the eater. Now, verse 11. So shall my word be that goes from my mouth. It shall not return to the empty, but it shall accomplish that which I purpose, and shall succeed in the thing for which I said. You must believe that. When you go to preach on Saturday at Greenfield Shopping Centre, it may seem a total waste of time. Maybe, according to you, nobody listens. But that's according to you. There might be somebody in their house, might there? Might there? Or up in the flat on top of the shop. You don't even know they're there. But they listen. I read this week of something that Charles Spurgeon, the preacher, used to do. He used to practice his sermon during the week. Empty church. So he used to stand there in his pulpit and preach. Well, this particular time, there were workmen working on the, uh, the building inside. And apparently, I don't know whether he really knew they were there, I suppose he did. Two or three were converted by his practice of the sermon. God is able to do what we can't think of, my friends. Our task is to service him. And in due time, fruit will be there. You may never hear it. It may be we preach and another church reaps the fruit. Praise the Lord for that. Maybe we would have been proud. But let's be sure that the purpose of God in the preaching of the gospel, it will succeed. So secondly then, I want to encourage you to take the light of salvation to all the nations. This was the great task 
given to the servant, the Lord Jesus Christ. He's the one who's gone ahead of us. He's the trailblazer. By his death and resurrection, his exaltation and the pouring out of the Spirit. He's been the preacher. Now he's gone to heaven. And now he's given us the Spirit. Why? So that we take over. And we are now the preachers. Maybe we neglect Acts chapter 1 verse 8 because of the, the bad use that is made of it. But Acts 1 8 is the Bible. And you shall be my witnesses. In Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. It started with, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. The Holy Spirit has been poured out with the specific purpose that we, the disciples of Christ, should take the message of Christ to the ends of the earth. Beginning where we are, our Jerusalem, we might say. The areas around Kenya, we might say, Judea and Samaria. And then to the furthest reaches, to the coastlands, and to the ends of the earth. I want to say to you, brethren, that this mission is not just one ministry of the church among others. We actually heard this this morning in almost identical words in the other Sunday. The task of taking the gospel is not one ministry among other ministries. It's the ministry. All other ministries contribute to that one and ultimately to the glory of Why do we continue to live on earth? Why not take us to glory? Will we not be worshipping God in heaven? So we can't be kept here simply to worship. We will continue to do this. And we'll do it without sin. Even we can't be kept here simply to be together. We will be together in glory with Christ. Are we not kept here in order that this great commission for which Jesus died and rose and gave his spirit be fulfilled through us, through the church? We say that we live to glorify God. What does it mean to glorify God? It doesn't just mean to mouth who he is. It's okay. But surely it means that men and women, boys and girls, from every nation under heaven, hear the gospel, and instead of praising false gods and idols and themselves, they start to worship the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Isn't God glorified in that? Above all, he seemed to be the true God, the God who saves, the God who, when he sent his son, his son accomplishes the work for which he came. So if it's God's intention, which it is, that the light dawn on the nations of the world to the ends of the earth, And God be glorified as long as that plan is not fulfilled. You know, when, somebody, when you make a plan and it fails, you don't get glorified for it, do you? You get humiliated for it. Somewhere you lack wisdom or you lack tenacity or something like that. When you make a plan and it works out even bigger than your expectations, then you will glorify. It's just on a human level. God is glorified when His plans for the Son are fulfilled. So my friends, 
Can we rest when there are multitudes? Millions, billions, will never heard the gospel. We've been introduced to how we can use the social media for the spread of the gospel. You can go into China, Pakistan, you name it, in the internet. Can't you? And you can have the opportunity to bring the gospel to people. There are no excuses for us today, but I'm going to remind you, you don't have to go further than Kenya. You all know that we have sought out a ministry in the land of the Rendili. And you know that there are people there, multitudes of them, they have never heard the gospel to this day. How can we rest when there are such people who are going to perish in darkness and the light of salvation, the message, has not even dawned upon it? So that's the task of the servant, it's our task in the name of the servant. So I just ask you three questions. Will you go? Yeah. Will you go to Los Angeles? There's no preacher of any description in Los Angeles or Ulukuli or places to which roads have not yet been built there in uh, the area of Ulukuli. Will you go? The message can only be taken if somebody goes. Why should it not be you? Will you give? It's money, doesn't it? How can somebody go unless they are supported? We have to be committed to support such people. And we pray. Maybe some of you particularly will pray. Why did you get on the tattoo? Go. See for yourself. I tell you, you'll never be the same again. It will even haunt you to think that there are people who've never heard. People where there are no messages. This then is the application. We must, as individuals and as a church, take the message of Christ throughout our land to the coastal areas. We're having to give up in its own. And yet there are four people groups there who are almost totally at reach with us. Who will go? Who will give? Who will pray? May God help us to be a faithful church. And please, let's not be people who get emotionally charged and say, today I go, and then do nothing. That doesn't glorify God either. Lord, you have shown us again your purpose for the gospel around the world. Forgive us, Lord, where we've been so comfortable, not even taking the gospel in our dreams. Pray that you'll help us with our relatives and neighbors and friends. Help us on Saturday here. Help the men who are coming from different parts of Especially pray for a Rendili land, the people because of their lifestyle, because they don't know other language, have not yet heard. We pray, Lord, oh Lord, so we raise up the language, take the message of the gospel there. In Los Angeles, may there be a church planted there. We commend ourselves to Lord, we don't want to run ahead of you. We ask, Lord, that you will do what you did in Antioch and say, separate me, Paul and Barnabas, for the work unto which I have appointed. And may you do it here, Lord. May we be a missional church that rest not until we have given ourselves fully to the spread of the gospel of Christ. Please help us to be willing to empty our pockets and to pray earnestly. Please use your word now. 
to that end, to the glory of your name. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.